I'm Scott. I'm Bill. And, and we're, we're the, the Trade, Trade Guys. Guys. You're listening to The Trade Guys, a podcast produced by CSIS where we talk about trade in terms that everyone can understand. I'm H. Andrew Schwartz, and I'm here with Scott Miller and Bill Reinch, the CSIS Trade Guys. On today's episode of The Trade Guys, Bill and I talk with Dan Etsy. Dan is a professor at Yale University who's recently spent two years on assignment to the World Trade Organization's leadership. We'll talk about trade and climate change as well as other topics. Thanks for listening and welcome to The Trade Guys. Hello, everybody. This is Trade Guy Bill, and today we have a special guest that I want to introduce. His name is Dan Esty, who is a professor at Yale University with primary appointments in the law and environment schools and the author of a lot of books and a lot of studies, uh, most notably the prize-winning book Green to Go and also A Better Planet, but also particularly relevant to our discussion. Dan is just back from a couple of years uh, working at the WTO with Director General Ngozi Okonjo-Iweta on developing a sustainable strategy for the global trading system. And in the process of doing that, he also has worked with colleagues both in organizations and governments and outside to produce something which is called the Villars Framework for a Sustainable Trade System. And so we're happy to have him here today in order to talk about trade and sustainability, which is a new buzzword, and you hear this often from Ambassador Tai. And so Dan is going to tell us what it's all about, and then uh, we're probably going to give him a hard time. So, Dan, before you go ahead, let me also just mention to our listeners that uh, short commercial here, the Shoal Chair has just published and put on its website a policy tracker on digital trade, where we are tracking the digital trade policies, proposed laws, laws, studies, and other possibilities in some 30 jurisdictions, including the EU. And we're going to update this monthly. So if those of you out, those of you that are out there interested in digital trade and digital trade regulation, go to the Shoal Chair website on, off the CSIS website. Look for our policy tracker. And there you can find more than you'll ever want to know about other countries' digital trade policies, procedures, and proposals. And so with that, Dan, let's come to you. Tell us about the, the Villars framework. Tell us about sustainability. Bill, thank you very much. Scott, it's a pleasure to be with you. It is a joy to have been away from Yale on public service leave for a couple of years and to have spent that time in Geneva thinking about how the trade system might be re-geared to be fit for purpose in the 21st century going forward. And of course, that top agenda item for the Director General, Ngozio Konjwiwala, she has uh, been trying to help the members come to a, a focus on how to re-gear the system around a critical set of agenda items. And it was, uh, you know, my privilege to be part of the team helping support her in that effort. And uh, separately, and I think to her credit, she said, Dan, please keep up the project you launched some years ago with a network of academics and policymakers, thought leaders uh, in trade and sustainability that is called the Remaking Global Trade for a Sustainable Future Project. And it's that project, Bill, that's now produced this comprehensive trade system reform agenda that was developed over the course of two years based on 10 workshops looking at various aspects of how the trade agenda connects with or sometimes clashes with the push for a more sustainable future. So we held workshops on trade and climate change, trade on and a transition to a clean energy future, trade and sustainable food systems and agriculture, looked at the transport issues and sustainable shipping. So a wide range of issues uh, in a series of workshops, each of which brought together 30, 40, sometimes 50 thought leaders with specific knowledge on those topics. And from that extracted this agenda that we then put forward as an outside perspective on what comprehensive trade system reform might look like. And put that forward at last year's WTO public forum, and then took it to the Swiss mountain town of Villar for a a long weekend of review and, in effect, peer review and substantive pushback, political assessment. And that agenda is now out in providing a basis for debate about how the trade system might be restructured. 
the foundation is the idea that the trade system is in some trouble. It's gotten a lot of pushback all around the world and, and significant pushback in a few key places. The United States has obviously moved in some different directions, but so has Britain. And I think there's really challenges all over to the at least the current way it's been working and frankly, not working, we might say. So this VLAR framework attempts to put front and center what we think of as the central mandate of the moment the WTO was created in 1995, launched after the Marrakesh was pulled together. And um, that has in its first paragraph a commitment to make sustainable development and a few other similar goals at the heart of the trade system. And our basic argument as the group that pulled this reform structure together is that that hasn't been taken too seriously. And the trade system would connect better with the public around the world, with political leaders that are questioning the value of trade, if it were made front and center. So that's what we've been doing. And in parallel, of course, these debates are going on in Geneva and among trade policymakers all around the world. And we do think it provides, uh, the Vilar framework provides it, a better foundation for re-gearing the trade system in a way that would attract public support, political support, and allow it to do the important work that it's long uh, providing a basis for economic development and sustainable opportunities for countries all over the world. We hear the term sustainability a lot, used it a lot. What exactly is the sustainability? What does it mean in practical terms? So it's a, a term that has uh, some flex to it, and that might in fact be a virtue and not a problem. But it is the idea that one wants to think about the agenda with regard to not only the current circumstances, but how this will play out over time. One wants to look not nearly at a single issue like economic opportunity, but how it connects to related issues like environmental impacts. And there is, in, in most people's mind now, a third pillar of social dimension to sustainability that also needs to be taken account of. So it really is an attempt to give a broader platform of assessment when thinking about how the trade system might work. And it really does, again, come down to an idea that launched in the middle 1980s, was consolidated in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, where we had countries from all over the world come together and say, we're focused now as a world community on sustainable development. And of course, that's uh, where the idea uh, began some focus. I wrote a book in 1994 called Greening the Gat, even before there was a World Trade Organization, and argued in that book that the trade system needed to be sure in order to make real its commitment to raising social welfare, that there weren't uninternalized externalities. And I was particularly focused on uh, environmental ones. But if you have these sort of offsetting losses, you can't be sure your gains are at net positive. And I think it's that spirit that we want to make sure we're looking comprehensively at the pluses and the minuses of how the trade systems operate. In short, that is sort of a, a way to imagine or think about the sustainability agenda. Well, ambiguity is no stranger to the trading system. In fact, uh, it was created by diplomats who used some very creatively used ambiguity over the years. Unfortunately, it's enforced by lawyers who have a little less flexibility, but that being as it may, this is a very interesting topic. And what I note is a lot of the, the impetus for this hangs on political commitments, particularly political commitments to net zero. Bill and I have been around Washington long enough to know about political commitments. For instance, this is the 20th anniversary of free trade in the Western Hemisphere, just, just so you know. Because in 1994, there was a political commitment to 10 years from now, we're going to have free trade. And uh, it didn't kind of quite work out that way, which, of course, there's a big gap between ambitions or aspirations and to goals, to ta targets, to actually binding commitments. And given what you know about the WTO and its binding commitments, how long, how will these political commitments hold up as we go and get to get to the tough parts? So you've raised really a critical issue that I think is at the heart of the debate that's going on around how trade and sustainability come together. And I think one of the challenges has been a sense in some parts of the policy world and the public beyond that the trade structure is damaging to other political commitments beyond the trade commitments, in particular that it somehow is a threat to, for example, the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change or the more specific 2021 Glasgow Climate Pact 
that, as you suggested, Scott, as the world as countries committed to going toward net zero greenhouse gas emissions by uh, roughly mid-century. And I think as countries are getting serious about that, there are questions being raised about how you get it done. And I think there is a, a sense that the trade system, it, for, for those who are uninitiated, that somehow the moving of goods is a part of the problem. You will know, and I'm happy to report, that in almost all cases, the, the goods being shipped around the world have a carbon footprint, as we sometimes say, referring, of course, to carbon dioxide, the most noble of the greenhouse gases we're worried about. The reality is that the shipping of those goods is actually rather small in terms of the impact as a greenhouse gas matter. When you look at the life cycle of a product, it's almost always in the production or the extraction of the original materials, and sometimes as well in the use of the product that consumes greenhouse gases for energy. So the truth of the matter is actually the opposite, that the climate change problem will be helped, not hurt, by a robust trade system. And that really is one of the original elements of what launched this uh, Remaking Global Trade project, the theory that the world had gotten upside down with regard to trade's role. And I do think we're quite confident that uh, the trade system can support uh, a movement towards a clean energy future, toward a, a low emissions future. And it is really the trade system that offers the promise of moving the clean energy technologies, products, services, infrastructure around the world at speed, scale, and frankly, at ever lower cost based on competition, if allowed to do so. Now, the truth is, you know, and, and your question suggests, is that the world makes commitments sometimes and doesn't follow through. But I think if you look at the sustainability agenda, the world's gotten quite serious about moving towards a low carbon future, a clean energy future. And whether it's going to stay fully on track, I'm not sure. But there's a lot being done, a lot of money being invested for a transition. And I do think the trade system is being called upon to be better aligned with that transition. And frankly, beyond climate change, which is the big issue in front of us, there is a set of sustainable goals, 17 of them that the UN has defined. And again, the world is on track in some regards to get to those goals. Many need more work. But there is a push for the trade system to be seen as supportive of that agenda and helping countries move toward meeting those goals as opposed to detracting from. Them. Well, I, I guess the my question on this has always been is how much of a how much of this can we load onto the trading system to fix? I mean, you you mentioned in your comments that if you talk about trade, the shipping part, the actual movement of, of goods from place to place is a small part on, on the environmental side of, of, of emissions, and that the larger part is in the production process. Why is trade responsible for fixing the production process? So I don't think trade is responsible for fixing it. But I think what you would really like to have is a trade system that is aligned in the instances it provides with these global goals of reducing emissions. And I think fundamentally what I've seen, not only in Geneva over the past couple of years, but in gatherings of people looking at the climate change problem at sustainability, is that there is a significant part of the business community ready to move toward a, a serious, low-carbon, clean energy future. And it let me just try that bit again, stopping there. There is in the business world a significant number of executives representing a very significant part of the global business community ready to move to a clean energy future. They are investing in a number of industries, substantial amounts. Uh, the amount of money being put into electric vehicles is a, a good example, running now into the tens of billions of dollars. The movement towards clean power production, again, measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars, and a significant number of other industries really beginning to get serious about what it will take to move to new business models that are aligned with a sustainable future. And it goes without saying that they want to make these commitments and have some assurance that they're not going to be undercut by people or competitors in other markets that make promises they don't keep, and that's okay. So that's the answer to Bill's question which is that these executives are ready to move, but not if there's a possibility or a probability that their competitors will not make the same moves, not invest the same money, not adhere to the same standards. And in doing that low performance output, will find themselves competitively disadvantaged. 
And I think the answer to Bill's question is that the trade system uh, may not be perfect. You know, I'm a critic of it in a number of regards, but I think it represents the single best structure to ensure what Scott, you just highlighted as the real risk, which is that the leaders here in moving towards this sustainable future will find themselves undercut, underpriced, and in that regard, lead to disadvantage in traded goods by those that are not paying attention to this commitment. Yeah, so the me. trade system offers a structure that would allow us to keep everyone moving together toward this sustainable future. Fair enough. Now, you've spent two years in Geneva, and and you don't have to, it doesn't take two years to figure out that you get what you bargain for in Geneva, that, that negotiating commitments to make them binding is is the whole game. And indeed, the WTO is probably best represented as a table, and it needs people around it to take action. Well, as I look at the agenda, what WTO has is non-discrimination as the universal solvent. Okay, so all the principles trace back to non-discrimination. You treat foreign goods the same way you treat domestic goods. That goes for principles like most favored nation. It goes for the subsidies agreements, which basically trade distorting subsidies are all disciplined, at least on the industrial side. It goes for something called production and process measures, where there have been a series of agreements that a tool is a tool is a tool. It really doesn't matter how it's made. Now, as I look at the climate change agenda in particular, and the, the net zero agenda, it seems like we're ready to throw out non-discrimination and move to discrimination based on my top priorities, at least on those three matters, MFN, uh, because you want a two-track WTO, or, or, the, or there's a mission of, mission of a two-track, not personalizing it to you, Dan, but, but also there, the, we, we, think, we can think now there are good subsidies and bad subsidies. Okay, instead of just bad subsidies or trade distorting subsidies. And we do think process and, and production methods are important. So how, how do you get from that core idea of the universal solvent is non-discrimination to we want our discrimination, not yours? So I think you highlighted an evolving sense of the values underpinning the trade system that need to be reflected in how it operates. Mm -hmm. And I would trace that back to the Marrakesh Agreement now 30 years ago, which said that everything the trade system does should be interpreted in light of this overarching commitment to sustainable development. So I think what you're highlighting is that when one asks the question about what should the WTO do with regard to subsidies, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to ask just one question. Is it trade distorting? It makes sense to ask two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, what's the purpose of the subsidy? And is it sustainability enhancing or sustainability diminishing? And then it's fair enough to ask if it's trade distorting. And one really wants to get movement toward items that are both pro-sustainability and not trade distorting as the target. But it does recognize that there may be some trade distortions that should be accommodated because the sustainability gains would be so substantial that some minor trade impact is worth absorbing. What's an example of that? In terms of the current situation, I think you would see uh, subsidies to support clean energy, if done in a way that minimize trade impacts, could be seen as a big sustainability advance and potentially at relatively low impact. And of course, that's what the U.S. would like to argue the Inflation Reduction Act is doing. And I do think there's a value in having the U.S. in the climate change game. It's clear the U.S. is having trouble doing uh, climate change policy the way others think it should be done with a, a price signal and making people pay for the harm they cause for their emissions. But the U.S. has now made a substantial commitment. And if the rough edges of that Inflation Reduction Act were taken off, particularly the domestic content requirements and a few other elements, you could actually have a pretty substantial package of subsidies that would, I think, meet the proportionality test of saying they're so beneficial to moving the world toward a sustainable future and addressing climate change, that a little bit of impact in terms of discrimination is worth absorbing. But if those if those rough edges were removed, and I, I see your point about that, wouldn't the wouldn't the remaining subsidies be consistent with WTO rules anyway? I mean, why is the trading why would the trading system get in the way at that point? Well, I think the historically the trade system has said that if there is a trade impact at all, it wants to reject these subsidies or push back on them. 
And I guess our view from the, the group that's put forward this reform proposal is to say, let's look at it in a somewhat more nuanced way. And let's really take seriously the idea that sustainable development is the overarching goal. And in that regard, we do want to do two things. One, give a green light, ultimately, to subsidies that are helpful from a sustainability point of view, provide an encouragement. And this is one of the things we've also developed, a set of disciplines about the subsidies that might have some trade impact and invite parties to try to be careful about how they structure the subsidies so as to minimize the impact on their trade partners. And then I do think uh, the other side of this is that the framework that we've developed would come down very hard on subsidies that are sustainability diminishing. So subsidies for fossil fuels have been long debated at the WTO with relatively little progress. We think there's now a, a new logic when you put sustainability front and center for really coming on those subsidies like fossil fuel subsidies, like the fish subsidies that lead to overcapacity and overfishing. And, and there's a series of other ones I would highlight in particular agriculture subsidies that promote production-based agriculture. And in that regard, by the way, you don't have to get rid of all farm subsidies. You would never do that politically, but you could actually ask people to convert their subsidies to ones that promote sustainable agriculture and really get away from the production-based uh, subsidies that distort trade in a serious way. Dan, the statement talks about finance as well as trade. And while that's not an area of the WTO's expertise, it is very important. And my own observation is that a 5% federal funds rate is the silent killer of almost every clean energy project out there. I, I, sort of, I watched the effects on offshore wind. It's just like as the treasury rates went up, the projects got canceled. It was linear. So what can be done in finance and, and what, what's the program and where would that locus of, of expertise and, and decision making focus? So, Scott, I think you are absolutely right that the key to success here can't be entirely left to the trade system. You need uh, equal efforts to re-gear how the global finance system flows the necessary capital to make these projects fundable. And, and frankly, trade without money isn't very good. Money without trade isn't good. So these are a linked pair. And one of the things you would see uh, Dr. Ngozi in her talks around the world saying is that we need absolutely to have a coordinated effort between the trade system and our multilateral development banks and the IMF, uh, the World Bank. All of these need to come together. And I think what you're starting to see is the real answer here is probably a re-geared Bretton Woods system broadly across all three pillars, IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization, each of which has a critical role to play. My own view is that the World Bank should be fundamentally recentered on a sustainable development future. I think Ajay Banga has been given that charge and is pursuing that already, but one could actually do it even more explicitly. And at that point, I think the World Bank should particularly fund the incremental cost of pursuing projects on a sustainable basis above and beyond whatever market return you can get for the traditional way of doing it. And that would uh, allow you to target funds in a quite effective way and really drive the uh, clean energy products that we need out across the world toward a, a faster deployment and also reduce, if you do it right, reduce costs because of scale economies and also the potential competition helping to keep prices in check. So there's quite a, an integrated opportunity here across the worlds of trade and finance, if pursued thoughtfully. Let me ask a slightly different question. How does all this mesh with geopolitical considerations that we're having to deal with right now? It's As we've discussed on this podcast many times, it's hard to have a conversation in Washington about trade without talking about China, but in, 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 and not talking about China and talking about national security, which has become conflated entirely with, with economics and trade. But in the context of, of a sustainability discussion, what do we see happening? China is rapidly becoming the producer of green stuff. They've captured the market of wind turbines. They've captured the market in solar panels. And they're in the process of capturing the market in EVs. In Europe first, they'll, they'll get to us eventually. All of them via massive subsidies. So is that okay? because those are green goals and, and, and they promote sustainable trade, even though it's wiping out other people's industries? So, Bill, there's, a, again, an 
nuance here that's got to be brought forward. And it's even more clearly put forward in a recent article that Elena Chima and I had published in the Journal of International Economic Law. And I think we spell out there in, in some precision what we think the disciplines on subsidies should be. And among those is a discipline that says you should not be subsidizing market dominant firms that in fact crowd others out of the marketplace. And I think the U.S. is right to complain that China is um, is subsidizing massively and doing so in a way that doesn't simply produce uh, sustainable industries and, and the products that are meant to give us a, a clean energy future, but doing so in a way that does end up dominating global markets, driving other competitors out of business. And that's worthwhile pushing back on. But the, I mean, just to be devil's advocate for a minute, the effect of that is to, in the case of solar, for example, is to slow down the transition. Because we don't, we don't have an industry that can step up and fill the, fill the gap that you would be creating. So at the current moment, there are clearly going to be some uh, slowdowns that would be created in critical areas of the green transition. Solar power, uh, wind turbines, electric vehicles, batteries, all of which have been the beneficiaries of huge Chinese subsidies. And the world could go forward with those industries and the production all being done in China. But I think political support for the green transition would collapse. We already see it not only in the United States, but huge pushback in Europe now, where there has been a case brought against the subsidies uh, that China's uh, underpinned its electric vehicle market with. And I think there is a sense that um, you know countries like Germany are not going to stand by and have their auto industry taken out by cheaper Chinese cars that reflect hundreds of billions, probably even a trillion in total subsidies over now uh, nearly two decades. So it's a it's a challenging balancing act. I do think uh, those that care about the green transition are uh, eager to see a variety of policy tools used to facilitate that process. But it, one of the challenges is you've got to do it in a way that doesn't undermine political support and frankly doesn't undercut other values in a society, like treating workers well and ensuring that there is a protection of fair competition in the marketplace. Well, it's a it's a delicate balance to maintain political support for these things. You mentioned Germany, and I've, I've watched the, the German politics proceed as they've tried to lead a transition to cleaner energy. And as I saw it, it was kind of all fun and games when we're shutting down nuclear plants. But at the moment, you have deindustrialization and re, 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 restaging and, and recommissioning coal-fired plants to avoid people being cold in the winter. And as a result, Chancellor Schultz, I think he has the lowest approval rating of any G7 leader. It's about 16% in the last survey I saw. So you know, it's, it's not fun if you, get this, if you get the equation wrong. Now, I think Germany's made some mistakes. You know, I think shutting nuclear plants, which is your best broad-scale, low-carbon power source is a serious error. And if I were advising the chancellor, I would say, let's rethink that one. Uh, it was a political judgment made in Germany, as you guys, I'm sure, remember, 50 years ago, in the wake of World War II, really. It was about the worry that nuclear power was somehow just a step away from nuclear weapons. And I think it, it miscalculated badly. The Germans had miscalculated badly to have that continue to be a dominant part of their uh, political thinking and their energy strategy. And, and yet, at the same time, we have to thank Germany for the massive subsidies they put into solar arrays, which helped motivate a significant uh, innovation process that has led to a much cheaper set of solar power opportunities today than ever would have existed. So this is, again, part of the balance. Um, some of that money is what is spurring innovation. And I'm a big believer that the pathway to this clean energy future and a sustainable future more broadly does need incentives for innovation. The real key here is not to bring people at a cost, it's to give people new opportunities so we can do all the things we want to do, but to do so in a cleaner way and a way that is ultimately cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable. Well, I guess a related question to that is whether you think carrots work better, work better than sticks. I mean, the United States has adopted, as you mentioned, more of a carrot approach in the IRA. We've seen on the EU side more of a stick approach, a, a regulatory approach. And here at CSIS, at least, we're seeing a bit of a pushback inside Europe on, on that, largely because we're some of the restrictions they've put in are now reaching the point 
where people are beginning to have to pay. And so once they have to pay, it suddenly has become a little bit more real than uh, when it was just a reporting requirement or something in the abstract. Do carrots work better than sticks or does it need to be a combination of both? And how does the, how does it WTO play in, in that world? The WTO is not going to ever be able to provide subsidies, but uh, maybe they can provide sticks. So the most important learning in management science over the last 50 years is portfolio theory, which says you want to have a mixed approach. And in this regard, say you want some carrots and you want some sticks. And I think the U.S. is leaning heavily on carrots because it has been so difficult to get sticks through the political process. Europe does have, as you say, a price signal approach. The European Union does have an emissions trading scheme that uh, has most industries paying a pretty substantial price for their greenhouse gas emissions. And what makes this interesting in the trade domain, as you know and your listeners will know, is that Europe is starting to make sure that price signal is applied to imported goods coming into the European Union through the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which goes by the acronym CBAM. And I think what you see in this regard is that the trade system, and this is, Bill, an answer to your question, is going to have to play some role in helping to adjudicate what an appropriate structure of border carbon adjustment looks like. And I would tell you from an analytic point of view, I think the European Union is conceptually correct. From a policy point of view, and I'm someone who spent 30 years working on climate change policy, I think it's essential. I do believe that you can't allow... Uh, any company in the 21st century going forward to seize a competitive advantage in traded goods by underperforming, again, agreed upon environmental standards, starting with, but ultimately not limited to greenhouse gas emissions controls. So I think there is a role for the WTO in helping Europe figure out what an appropriate framework looks like. And uh, while I've said that the European CBAM is conceptually correct, policy-wise essential, I think the current framework is seriously flawed and uh, needs to be cleaned up before it gets rolled out in a significant way with real tariffs being collected, as is proposed, that, uh, not next year. Yeah, that's interesting. Can you pursue that a little bit? The EU claims that it's WTO compliant. I mean, it's hard to say because nobody's paid anything yet, but the EU claims that it's going to be WTO compliant. Do you think it's not? I think the European Union has real challenges, and I I think it is. it goes back to a comment you made earlier. If you believe that production process and methods distinguishes one good from another, and this is at the crux of the European Union claim, then dirty production produces a different good than clean production, and therefore you can discriminate against the dirty product. I think the European Union, in setting out its strategy here, would do well to spend more time thinking about how different approaches to climate change could be made interoperable. The U.S. is not going to do things the way Europe's going to do it. We've got 190 other countries that'll do it their own ways. So what we really need is a structure that says, let's give credit for roughly comparable approaches to climate change. And oh, by the way, it would be good if we had an agreed upon methodology for how to measure the greenhouse gases associated with traded goods rather than have the European Union assert their approach and, frankly, to penalize people that can't produce data sufficient to the European Union strategy. And it would also be useful if there was a commitment to a global social cost of carbon so that the actual tariff was based upon an agreed-upon price rather than the European Union asserting its own standard. So, Bill, the, the true answer is that the European Union is in a quite unilateral posture right now And it would be much better if some of these things were done in a conversation and negotiated, which would give them more legitimacy. Which is what we're trying to do in the green steel and aluminum agreement without much progress. It does sound like a moment for the WTO to to actually start a negotiation or something like that. You guys guys probably know that the WTO has been supporting a green steel conversation and that, in fact, announced at the climate change conversation, the the COP28 negotiations in Dubai in December, that there was now a set of green steel principles that a significant number of companies agreed upon. And it was facilitated by the WTO providing a platform for that conversation. And I really think that's what the WTO can do going forward is to help countries come together, I think on an industry by industry basis, 
to set appropriate standards. And again, this is not the WTO doing it. It's simply convening the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, relevant industry groups. Frankly, there's good work being done at UNCTAD and at the International Trade Center on some of these issues. But now we need to have people get to the nitty gritty, work out standards that are agreed upon or broadly uh, accepted, if not entirely agreed upon. And then they'll have some legitimacy as people try to deploy them. Is it Can that be done plurilaterally? And we've seen the, w, the WTO has had a lot of problems producing multilateral agreements for a variety of reasons. We just saw that in the last ministerial. Is it better for them to pursue the kinds of things you're talking about through joint statement initiatives and plurilateral agreements? Or is that, or is that just the best they can do, even if it's not the best? I think the plurilateral framework is going to be what underpins a lot of this, because you can get many people to come together and agree on some of these issues, but not everybody. And I think if you get most people to agree, you've got a pretty solid foundation to go forward and it will have legitimacy. And what's been impressive to see in the steel conversation is you do have steel makers from India, from China, from the United States. And I don't think everybody in the end would come together completely. But on some parts of this, a methodology for measurement of greenhouse gases. I think you get most people pretty close. And that, again, would help give this a more serious foundation and signal that the WTO is eager to support standards that are scientifically based, analytically carefully crafted, and therefore seemingly more appropriate as a basis for the decisions that have to be made. Yeah, we've written about measurement, and I think you're exactly right. If you don't have a common means of measuring you just evolve into endless arguments about this policy as being more protectionist than the others. Yeah, the WTO members uh, members ought to get started because once you get started on something, there'll be a whole group who don't want to be left out. <laughs> you create some momentum for that and then begin to move. So, Dan, thank you so much for joining the program. We were delightful to, to, to be able to talk with you. You're knowledgeable about an issue that is going to be the center of so much of the trade debates in the in the months and years to come. So we appreciate that. We also appreciate your 30 plus years of laboring in the vineyard on this particular topic. Greening the Gat was a great book at the time and it still stands up very well today. Yes, thank you. So uh, my compliments on that, but thanks so much for helping us keep our readers up to date on what's going on. Really a pleasure. Thanks for having me on the podcast. To our listeners, if you have a question for the Trade Guys, write us at tradeguys at csis.org. That's tradeguys at csis.org. We'll read some of your emails and have the Trade Guys react to it. You've been listening to the Trade Guys, a CSIS podcast.